Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our beautiful Sunday service. So glad that you're here. We're going to start by singing our opening chant, One with the One. <laughs> Sam, thank you, all of our musicians. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's service. We're so excited that you decided that this is your place of worship this morning and that you here are with us. We're so grateful. Please shut off your phones. And you there in Facebook and Zoom land, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So let's pray. Just take that breath right here and right now and recognize that breath is the breath of God, that right where you are, God is breathing you. I'm so grateful to know that we have this understanding and this knowingness. So today is a day of great blessings. This service is blessed. Something wonderful is happening because we are in the yes of God, the yes of the flow. And what I know to be true is that each and every person here in person or virtually, right here, their heart is expanding to receive the word, to receive a message that absolutely transforms and provides love and joy and harmony. We bless our beloved Dr. Mark. We know that right now, even as I speak this word, Dr. Mark is surrendering his little self to his high holy self, and he brings us a word that lifts, fills our heart with love, fills our mind with infinite possibilities, and fills our soul with the goodness of God. Thank you, beloved Mother, Father, God. I'm so grateful. This is the truth, and I release this word into the law of mind, knowing it is made whole and manifest. And so it is, together we say, Amen.
Thank you, thank you so much. Please rise and join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in our congregational hymn, It's in Every One of Us. It's in every our meditation right now for five minutes. So I invite you to close your eyes, focus on your breath, get centered, and let's just silently repeat, repeat, God's the love that I am. God is the love that I am. And if your mind wanders, just bring it right back to that God is the love that I am. And I'll bring us out in five minutes.
He gets there. Oh my God, I love this. We are an abundant church. We have microphones. <laughs> so here we are. So today is our first Sunday. Oh, I'm sorry. I have more costumes on than I know what I'm. <laughs> today is our first Sunday in our journey of the heart. And our journey of the heart is the time of year when we ask people to think about what the church, our church, means to them. What does this place mean in your life? And to think about what you will contribute to this church in the year ahead financially. And what this allows us to do is kind of make a plan for what we're going to do in 2022. So what we do during this month, uh, the month that starts right now, is we have people from our congregation uh, come up and share something about what the church means to them. And so today I'm going to invite uh, Chip Clemens and Lois Fletcher to please join us on the platform and share with us. So if you would welcome them with me. to talk first. <laughs> well, I want to tell you that it's a true pleasure to be here with you in this sacred place. I was so happy to hear about God so frequently in the beginning because God has been a really important part of my life since I was three years old. I asked the neighbors next door where they were going and they said to church and I asked my mother if I could go and she said okay and today I just turned 80 years old last month. I'm now 80. Uh, thank you. The reason I'm telling you that is since I was three, God has been in my life. And I have not gone a night without praying. And, and when Chip and I found the Church of Religious Science, it'll be 36 years ago in January, where we met in that sacred space, I knew it was divine intention. I'd been a single mother for nine years, was never going to marry, was positive I wasn't wife material, had three, <laughs> had three little kids. And a year later, Chip and I were married by a Church of Reli Religious Science minister. So I want to tell you how important the Church of Religious Science is to me, how important God is to me, how important Dr. Mark is to me. I've had so many good conversations with him. And I just want to tell you that I'm grateful that Chip and I were here. We love being of service to the church, so thank you. Good morning. Um, you know, I was thinking a lot about what I was going to say today, and I was taking a shower this morning, and naturally it all sort of came to me, as everything does in life, right? Pretty much it's in the shower that we work it all out. But I actually thought of this church. I was thinking church is sort of like that. You know, we're all here, people out in Zoom land are here, and it's like there's a shower above us, except instead of water, the light of God comes down on us in this place. And that's how it feels to me. It's a sacred place, and it, it's uh, meant so much to me. We've been coming here for 17 years. Um, and I, I went through a very hard time uh, this summer. I haven't had many of those in my life, but I, I really did, and I, I became very uncertain. Um, and, and Lois is born with this incredible faith, as she said. And I'll say one, one story about her when she went to church when she was five years old. The neighbor woman looked over, and here's Lois singing away in there, and she's holding the hymnal upside down. <laughs> Doesn't matter. With Lois, you don't have to read it. She's just got that feeling. But for me, and maybe some of you, and as Dr. Mark would say, if not you, then someone you know, has a harder time developing that faith. It's not some natural thing I had. When we used to go to Sunday school, which I hated, the thing I loved was my dad would make pancakes afterwards, and so that was, that's where I started. And I've had to really work at it. And I work with my praying, I sing the chants that we have here, and when I was really feeling down this summer, one of the wonderful things that happened is one of the practitioners in training here, Nikki, was assigned me and her list of people to call. And I'm telling you, those calls from her were so helpful to me. And it reminds me that maybe all churches, but certainly this one, it's not so much about Ernest Holmes, although he's wonderful. It's not even so much about Dr. Mark. It's about the people in this church. 
That to me is the incredible strength. And the people are joyous and loving and kind and generous. And how much that has helped me and, and how proud we are to be part of that, that congregation. Um, I'll, I'll close with uh, the famous words from uh, John F. Kennedy, and I'll paraphrase this a little bit, where he said, don't ask what your church can do for you. <laughs> ask what you can do for your church. And I'll guarantee you, and we've experienced in our lives that, you know, have been incredibly prosperous. Um, and I think a lot of that is from our giving to the church. And as we say, whatever you give comes back to you multiplied abundantly. So I would say wherever you are on the journey, if you are like Lois, the true believer and from the beginning, or you're like me where you're on that journey, let's do more for the church. Give more, do more. And it'll all come back to us, and, and it'll just be a wonderful thing. And it does. That's right. It comes back all the time. So anyway, thank you very much for inviting us here and into your homes today. It's a great privilege for us to be part of this congregation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, let me take that first. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Wow, that was great. Thank you so much. That was so fun. So in your uh, program, if you've got a program today, there's a little pledge card here. And we'd ask you to think about that, take it home with you, pray about it. What does this church mean to me? And tell us what you're going to contribute so we can make a plan for the year ahead. This really helps us enormously. Okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of my priorities or our priority. And so I've thought about this a lot, and um, especially because we've had so much time uh, recently, uh, in recent months, and it's really simple for me. My priorities go in this order. My relationship with God, my relationship with family, and my work. So those are my top three. God, family, work. Hmm. That seems like it, would, like it makes sense, but what I know is that in the process of living my life, I get pulled in so many other directions that it seems like when I'm trying to focus on God, I have to focus on something else. And when I'm trying to focus on family, I have to, you know, it's, it's just never uh, lines up quite the way I think it should. Uh, because, of course, I know how it's all supposed to be. Uh, it's a, the, sort of the inside track I have. No, I'm just kidding. I don't mean that. But something that we teach that I think is really connected to this or really relevant to this is that whenever we put love into the law, because we are working with a spiritual law that, as Ernest Holmes says, responds with mechanical regularity to our thinking. Whenever we put love into the law, something good always happens. Right? So if I put love into the law in the area of my relationship with God when I'm praying and when I'm meditating and when I'm affirming and doing all this good spiritual work that I like to do, I know something good will happen from that. With regards to my family, when I'm thinking about them, when I'm interacting with them, if I put love into the law, I know only good will come from this. So let me give you an example. I was talking with a family member recently, and they were really, really struggling with some stuff. They were having a really hard time. And my first impulse, of course, being the good codependent that I am, is I wanted to rush in and fix it all and make it better for them. And after I took a second inhale, I realized that was not my job. It was not my business. My job is to talk with them, be supportive, pray for them, let them know I love them, and let them know that most importantly, I know they have within them everything they need to move through this experience that they're going through. Whenever we put love into the law, something good has to happen. So Henry David Thoreau, one of the American transcendentalists from back in my neck of the woods in, in Massachusetts, Thoreau said, your religion is where your love is. And I like that because it's just so simple. Your religion is where your love is. 
Science of mind teaches us that one of the qualities of God, the primary quality of God, is God is love. Now, when we talk about God, we're talking about this love and intelligence that actually creates the universe out of itself. So that means that we are all emanations of God, that we are God's children. And therefore, we have the attributes and the qualities of God within us, perhaps not in full expression yet, but waiting to be cultivated, qualities of God within us that are waiting to be brought forth into expression. So I think we want love to be the guiding principle of how we live our lives. You know, to be obedient to the law of love brings us into the kingdom of God. And obedient, what I mean by obedient is service to God through service to each other. This, I believe, really is sort of how we all evolve and rise up. You know, obviously we share the planet with other people. And so we might say, you know, well, I don't like what this person's doing over here. I don't like what that person's doing over there. I remember years ago, I went to a practitioner. Um, her name was Vitura Papti, and she had been Ernest Holmes' practitioner. And so I thought, okay, I want the big guns. I need big help. And I went to her and I was complaining about something. I was complaining about somebody at work and I was complaining about something at home and I was complaining about this and that. And uh, I was just telling her all these things that people in my life were doing that I didn't like. And she sat there very patiently, very patiently. And finally she looked up at me and she said, are you through, dear? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And she said, okay. Now, do you like everything that you do? And that really stopped me short. Because the truth was, I didn't like everything I did. I, I really didn't. And it's like, well, no. And she went, well then, are we ready to move on? <laughs> yeah, honest to God, that was it. Well, you don't like everything you do. Clearly, you're not going to like what everybody else does. So just be loving and move on. That's it. You know, I don't have to have a whole big story or Megillah about it and collect evidence and all that stuff. We are sharing the planet with other people. It's a guarantee. A lot of them are not going to do what I like every single day. And you know, I can be peaceful and loving in the midst of that. I believe I really can. We are taught to pray for our enemies, whatever that is. Anything that seems not right. Anyone who is not uh, a loving person in our life. We don't Pray for them. Pray for your enemies. And we are also taught to forgive those who persecute you or treat you ill. Now, I think that this whole notion of serving God has to do with, well, nobody can serve God except in loving service to other beings, right? Because there is no God separate and apart from us. We teach, the mystical teaching of the ages is that God is one and we are all one, that we're all connected. So what I do to you or don't do to you, I am actually doing or not doing to myself. I will feel the effects of that. So no one said it would be easy, right? <laughs> you know, and I know, just, I'm like everybody else, it's really easy to love the people I already love. You know, it's so easy to give them more love and encouragement and be in their corner and speak words of positivity to them. Absolutely, because I already love them and I know they love me back. And there's not a lot of growth in that. I think it's a good thing to do, but there's not a lot of growth in that for me personally. <sighs> so where's the growth? With those people I disagree with, with those people I might get mad with, those people who I think have a, are completely wrong or, or whatever that may be. So my goal, my personal goal, is for everyone to experience unconditional love and acceptance and joy in life. You know, for everyone. I mean, I think that's really big, and I don't know that we'll get there in my lifetime, but that's certainly what I would like to see, for everybody to experience unconditional love and acceptance and joy. I mean, look at it. If we all had that, I think our world would just be so, so different. You know, I was thinking about this and I thought, well, what are, what are my experiences of unconditional love? And the first thing I, I, I hit on was like, well, of course, parents love their children unconditionally, even if you spill the milk. You know, the parents don't, your parents don't stop loving you when you were a kid and you knocked over the milk. Or, you know, you broke something or on and on and on. I think you don't stop loving the people who are closest to you because they make a choice that isn't um, something you agree with. You know, but I also understand that every soul has their own path, and everybody has to learn the things that they have to learn for their own spiritual growth and, 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 and evolution. So the only truly spiritual life possible, I think, is lived in keeping our thoughts, 
and deeds in what I'll call at one minute this morning, which is in alignment with the law of love. That our goal, I think, our purpose on earth is to put more love, that each of us is to be a vessel, a vehicle for God's love to move through us out into the world in some positive life-affirming way. You know, that the love that does unto others as we would have them do unto us, right? This is what the golden rule, of course, and, and Ernest Holmes, our founder, found a golden rule in almost every spiritual tradition on the earth. Different words, but basically the golden rule. Now, if we put love into the law, so what do I mean by that? So there is a law of mind and operation that responds to our thinking with mechanical regularity. So if what we do is we intend to treat people in a loving way, we intend for love to be the predominant vibration that emanates out from us into the world, good will return. Right? Now this is not just, um, uh, I was thinking this week, you know, people love Labels. I know I do. I'm trying not. I'm trying to work with that. But um, you know, because it's just so nice to be able to categorize. But now I realize so much has changed in the last mm, 30 years that um, that that doesn't that doesn't work so well now uh, because we don't just fit. You can't. People don't fit with a label. You know, we're more than that. We are all such multi-dimensional beings. You know, so I might do one thing, but that's not who I am. Who I am is all this other stuff too. So. We're not just a label. So if somebody says, well, I'm a Christian, it's like, well, that's a wonderful thing. But if I said that, I would have to ask myself honestly, am I endeavoring on a daily basis to be somewhat Christ-like? If I said I'm a Buddhist, is, am I asking myself every day, am I trying to be Buddha-like in my interactions with other people? Okay, I can say it. I'm a religious scientist. Am I practicing the science of mind in my relationships with other people and being the most loving person I could possibly be. You know, I think there are, uh, we always have role models, you know, for how we like to be. And I remember saying, you know, um, when you're young, it's easy to find role models a decade ahead of you, right? You know, so when you're 20, you can see somebody who's 30 and they're doing really well and you go, wow, I want to be just like that. Lois, thank you for being here today, for being my model, you know, of, of, of a decade ahead of me so I can say, that's what I want to be like. Because you know, as you get older, a lot, lots of role models when you're 20, 30 a few less. When you're 40, there are less role models who are doing really great in life and you say, God, I want to be just like that. Well, by the time you're 60 and 70, looking for somebody who's a decade ahead of you, who's a great role model, there are less and less of them around. Have you noticed that? I, you know? And so for us, I think it's really important that we see people who are doing well and saying, yes, see, that's possible for me. That's possible for me. I think that so often in life, we have stood back and said, well, I'm waiting for love to come to me. You know, but I think someone outside of it is really never the source. That's not what we teach. Because what we teach is that since God is within everyone, that love actually exists within us right now. It's already there. And what we do, and I think what we allow ourselves to do, is sometimes in the presence of some people, particularly where we feel loved or safe, we allow that to open up from within us and be expressed outward into the world. And I think there are ways that we do this, very simple ways, on a daily basis, like by giving people a break, by letting people merge, yeah, oh, that's a good one, letting people merge, right? You know, expecting and encouraging people, right? Just saying a good word. You know, by when, we, when we drive past people on the road, by just saying a little blessing for them. You know, by, by being willing to forgive. Even when we say, oh my God, how many times am I going to have to forgive here? And we do it again and again. By allowing people to be who they are. You know, one of the highest teachings that Emma Curtis Hopkins gives us is just this. She says, to know that it's perfectly of God to let be, to just let people be. See, I think we forget that everybody has their own journey. Every soul has their own evolution. And, and like Ernest Holmes says, the soul is on a journey. The journey is back to the Father's house, and everybody makes it. I love that. I, I, you know, the bigness of that, that everybody makes it, is so thrilling to me because that says to me, you know, nobody gets left behind. I kind of grew up in a tradition where I thought a lot of people were being left behind. Okay, I was one of them. And uh, clearly, I was definitely in the left behind. You know, when the mothership left with the chosen, I would not be on the ship. <sighs> I think everybody knows when we're functioning with love 
and when we're kidding ourselves, you know? I think uh, in my own journey, egotism and conceit come in, and, and what I realize is that that will cheat us, you know, by developing within us sort of this self-righteous thing, you know, and telling ourselves, I don't have to be loving here. But you know, if we look at the lives of, of the saints, of great spiritual masters, their power came from love. You know, Emmett Fox has that wonderful phrase that I love so much. He says, if only you could love enough, you would be the most powerful person in the world. And I think we're mistaken so often because we think love is going to make me wimpy or it's going to make me weak or ineffective in the world. But you know, when I, when I consider other people who demonstrated tremendous love, I, Mother Teresa, okay? Mother Teresa was all about love, I think, and that love was so powerful that she could ask people to stop a war for a few days so she could go in and take children out of hospitals or homes and get them out of a country that was in the midst of being war-torn. Has anybody else been able to do that? I mean, you know, like to say, please, can you stop the war? I need to get the children out and then you can continue with your war. And she's done that. You know, that has how powerful the love within her is. You know, that people, the world recognize that. You know, so I think love is something we have to get that it's not something that's gonna be added to us, it's going to flow out from us. And the more it flows out from us, the more we find we have. The more we find we have. You know, we know if we're functioning through love or if we're functioning through something that's less than loving, right? Uh, I found this quote that I love this week from Eleanor Roosevelt, and she just said, the giving of love is an education in itself. And isn't that true? Isn't that true? I mean, boy, I have learned so much about myself in the journey to be more loving. You know, when I found the science of mind, I was so incredibly grateful because this teaching gave me the tools to become the person I wanted to become or to become more of the kind of person I wanted to become. I, I knew who I wanted to be as a person, but I didn't know how to get there. I mean, I really didn't. But then when I found these teachings, this made sense to me, you know? And I thought, okay, this is something, this is something I can work with. At the very center of our being, God has incarnated himself in us. God is in every single person. I think that is just so fantastic to think about, that God is in every person who ever existed since the beginning of time. And every person has the seed of, of, of Godhood at their center. That sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? We have the seed of Godhood at our center. And I think, well, that's kind of like, you know, when you're a kid and you get Cracker Jacks. I always loved Cracker Jacks, because, and, you know, and it wasn't the Cracker Jacks, it was the prize. I'm, I'll be the first to tell the truth on it. Loved the prize, didn't really care about the Cracker Jacks that much. There were never enough peanuts for me. Uh, but you know, you get some kind of little ring or a little spider or little tattoos. Love the tattoos, of course, I love those. And, um, but it's like, we're like the Cracker Jacks and God's the prize inside, really. You know, whenever we say I, whenever we use that word I, we should realize that the presence of God is there, right? Because I is that highest and best within us. We might say that it's the Christ or the Buddhic mind, right? That we're in attunement with it when we are doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. The truth is, you know, it's not that hard. It's really not. How can I say it plain? Be nice! <laughs> You know, I mean, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. You know, in the Bible, we're told to forgive 70 times 7. I don't think everybody had a calculator on their phone back then. And so I think what, what Jesus meant by that is that you just forgive and forgive and forgive until you don't need to do it anymore. You know, and we are told to be sharing and giving and uh, bestowing our love on each other. I think we violate the law of love when we desire anything anything that wouldn't be good for someone else. So if we're resentful of somebody, or we're blaming somebody, or we ascribe the wrong motives to somebody else, that's not putting love into the law. I believe, all right, this is just me. So I never got up in the morning and said, you know, God, today, let me really screw things up. Let me be a jerk to people I meet. Let me be, I've never, you know, I've never ever done that. But, you know, we violate the law of love when, when we're hurtful toward other people or seeking revenge or blame, like I said. 
we're here for God. And what that means is that we are here for God's love to move through us in a greater way. And when that happens, I'm certain that healing always takes place. You know, because when love is present, then anything unlike it starts to disappear. See, the only God there is, is the incarnation of God in each of us. That's the God that we will get to know. And so I would ask you this week to think about what are my priorities? What are my priorities? Like I said, for me, it's God, it's family, it's work. And I know there's overlap with all of those things, and probably so for all of us. And in my life, when I put love into the law, I know that something good will happen. It's the way God has wired the universe. Won't you pray with me now? Let's turn our attention inward for a moment. And remember that right here where we are, the place whereon we stand is holy ground. So I speak this word for myself and for everyone here that I desire only good in my life, in our lives. And I declare in the name of God that all resentments and negative motivations are completely dissolved that each and every one of us, we deeply experience the unconditional love of the infinite spirit. I know that that love within us is the most true, real thing about us. And I accept for each and every one of us this day that our life is guided by that principle of love, that that love of God within us is so great it heals anything unlike itself. And anywhere we have been unwilling to open our heart, I claim for us today, we're willing for it to crack open a little bit more and for a little more light to shine in and for us to be able to give that back out to the world. So we let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in, touching all people everywhere, no one overlooked, everyone included. We know everyone is God's perfect child in whom he is well pleased. We bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, every place people gather to know the one. And I know we are blessed by being together today, that we are rising above the race consciousness and making a conscious choice for our own betterment, for the betterment of the world that we live in. And so with a heart that's full, I say, thank you, God. Thank you for this and every blessing that fills our lives. And so it is, and so we let it be. Together we all say, amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. So blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful, I am so blessed. All right, I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much. I am so blessed. I am so much, Mary. That was just wonderful. And if you want more of Mary's music, you can get that at M-A-R-H-Y-L-C at AOL.com. And thank you to all of our beautiful musicians and our support staff. We got no church without the support staff. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Um, so ways you can make donations, call the office at 818-762-7566. Go to 
nhcrs.org slash give. Text the word give to 818-457-3419 and shop Amazon Smile. You can select our church. You'll find uh, Church of Religious Science North Hollywood as the, that charity of choice, then it benefits the church at no cost to you. I mean, we're all shopping, and we're just going to get to send money to the church by just shopping. So that's wonderful. Please sign up for that. Prayer with the practitioner after service is in person here up front or on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, transfer over to Zoom, and you can have prayer with the practitioner. Um, we email prayer requests to prayer at nhcrs.org or you can put a request in the prayer box back there. You can call in a prayer request to the church office and hit option four. This upcoming Wednesday, October 27th, we are going to have our regular Wednesday night service, meditation at 6.50, service starts at seven with our beautiful Reverend Sydney, and her topic is God's will. Say what? <laughs> you, it's her topic. Youth Church is open on Sundays. We welcome our youth of all ages at 9.45 a.m. service, and we're currently out on the lawn outside. So come on, kids. Um, grief support groom, group on Zoom. The group facilitated by our beautiful practitioner, Carol Winokur. It meets today on Zoom at 1 p.m. And guess what's happening? We have this Friday, Freak Spooktacular, Halloween costume party, and... Yeah, go ahead. Freak Spooktacular. Costumes. <laughs> Wear costumes. Costumes. We're coming to costumes. Absolutely. That's all, That's all she has to say. Costumes. Tell them the rest. Come in costumes. It's this Friday. This Friday, 7 to 10 p.m. Join us at 7 p.m. sharp for a costume contest with super fun prizes, followed by a screening of the movie Young Frankenstein. Yes. Food and treats on the patio. Please sign up on the patio if you're planning to attend, or you can email Terry at admin, A-D-M-I-N, admin at nhcrs.org. Our bookstore is open for 30 minutes after service every Sunday. Please stop by. We have our Zoom virtual patio for those of you who would like to have community after church on both before and after Sunday and Wednesday services. Every day, Monday through Saturday, we have Zoom meditation at 8 a.m. Please join us for that great way to start your day. Um, and visit our website nhcrs.org to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events and sign up for our weekly email blasts and our monthly newsletters. Thank you so much. Please stand for our peace song.
please repeat after me. I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I am living love. Amen. Thank you so much.